We are rooted in our history. And this is important because most of our opinions and views are constructed of narratives, of stories, stories we grew up with, stories we hear of, stories we read, stories we are told. Because how do we form our views? If I mention Cleopatra, Queen of Egypt, for example, do you immediately think of how she was praised for her intellect by Arabic scholars? Or do you think of Cleopatra in the way um, Shakespeare wrote about her? Or do you think about how stunning Elizabeth Taylor was playing her? Or how she was this crazy little thing in the Asterix and Obelix stories? Or let me tell you about a personal experience. One of the strongest narratives I personally experienced in my life is linked to Dracula. You see, I am from Transylvania. For most of you sitting in this room who are Hungarians or live in this part of the world, there is nothing surprising about that. But try to mention Transylvania to someone who is not familiar with Eastern European history. And except for rare occasions, people would go, um, Transylvania, well, um, is that really a place? And then if I'm lucky, then Dracula gets mentioned. Because then most of the time they would continue, Transylvania, right, Dracula. And then sometimes even, will you bite me now? And then I'm not quite sure what they are hoping for when they ask that. But um, believe me, I do feel lucky when Dracula gets mentioned, because then at least we have something to start with. And this something is at least in some connection with history. Then I do not need to prove that Transylvania is really actually indeed a place and not just some imaginary land from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, and then I can launch into my long, long maniac monologue about how Transylvania is a wonderful place where many nationalities have lived together for, from very early on, what a wonderful melting pot of cultures it is, uh, what an amazingly rich cultural heritage it has and how it was protecting the borders of Europe for centuries and so on and so on and how real and inspiring it is for me. But most of the time, it doesn't matter how fascinating and interesting the history of Transylvania is, because Dracula is unbeatable. His marketing is rock solid. Uh, for some time, I used to live in Transylvania on an estate which happens to be relatively close to Braun's castle. This is a fortress built in the 14th century by King Louis Anjou I, who was the Hungarian king that time. It is a fortress where once an important battle was fought and the army of the Ottoman Turks was defeated. It belonged to one of the Saxon cities of Transylvania and protected its citizens for long and violent years of history. But none of this is really relevant, because most of the tourists visiting the fortress only want to hear about Dracula. Unfortunately, Bram Stoker's world-famous vampire, or his role model, Vlad Cepes, the Valachian Voivodin, doesn't have a lot to do with the fortress. It is hardly proven that Vlad Cepes even set foot in the fortress, ever nor did he spend too much time in Transylvania, as a matter of fact. You see, I mean, he was attacking it from time to time, but you see, he was ruling in a neighboring country, Valachia, and Valachia, Transylvania, not the same. I'm not quite sure how easy it would be to convince a Hollywood producer about the differences, but... Anyhow, so you see, this is how stubborn, st strong narratives and stories can grow, and I think they can have quite a quick and direct impact as well. A couple of years ago, I was visiting Volterra, a lovely little town in Tuscany, Italy. And it was packed with teenagers from all over the world. And do you know why? Because Volterra happens to be the seat of the ruling vampire dynasty, the Volturi, at least in the world-famous Twilight Saga books. And suddenly, this sleepy little Italian town, which, granted, does have an impressive prison, and it's beautiful, becomes a tourist attraction, big time. But uh, I wanted to talk to you about narratives and not so much about vampires. Um, or maybe just a little bit more of something like that. Who do you think would be the internationally most known Hungarian woman? Would it be Zsa Gábor or Barbara Polvin? Well, my guess would be Elizabeth Bathory. The monster who bathed in the blood of virgin girls. The sadistic domina of the Dark Ages of Hungary. So she's known. And now to the facts. She was accused and walled in for killing some of her servant girls. There were more than 300 witnesses, all testifying against her. According to Gábor Várkonyi, one of the most prominent historians and researchers of the period, what happened was the following. Most of these 300 witnesses died shortly after they gave their testimony. 
all of them, with three exceptions, were testifying that they heard something, that somebody heard something. And these three exceptions were the three men who accused Elizabeth Bathory in the first place. These were three employees of her husband's family. And when her husband died on the battlefield, uh, Elizabeth Battery made a mistake. She had the list drawn up of all her properties and incomes. And as a result, it was very likely that she would find out that these three men were cheating and stealing from her family for decades. So these three men had to act quickly and they had to accuse her of something, with something substantial. Because socially, she was so high above them, it had to be something terrible she's accused with. And this is how it all started, the legend of a woman who traded her soul to the devil to stay young and beautiful. So you see, narratives can often lead to false or imaginary theories. Sometimes they can leave, lead to distortions, illusions, and sometimes, quite simply, outright lies. But why is this important? I think this is important because narratives shape us. The heroes, the heroines, the patterns we experience, we are told, they all shape us. For centuries, these narratives were presented to us through storytelling and books. Nowadays, it's mainly TV series and Snapchat. But uh, cinema and TV production still need scripts, and the root of the matter is still a story. The story. Because without basic writing, you can't even run a Twitter account. Well, some can, but that's a different TED talk. Um, and I think that the most powerful narratives come from good stories. And as a writer, this is what I'm interested in. A couple of years ago, I was offered a contract to write a new novel. All I knew was that I wanted it to be a story rooted in history. So I started to look up the characters of the Hungarian historical fiction. And one of the first ones was Anne Bathory. Anne Bathory was the niece of the previously mentioned monster, Elizabeth Bathory, and she too, Anne, was much written about in Hungarian literature. But when I started to look up the historical facts about her life, I got very surprised and I found my heroine. As a fiction writer, I knowingly and willingly create narratives. But I do try to respect historical facts, it is important for me not to contradict them. And suddenly, I found myself writing about strong women. It wasn't my intention or focus at the beginning, but while I was researching the history of the 17th century, they were all there, all these amazing, strong women, but not really visible, only in faded away grey colours. My heroine, Anne Bathory, was one of the last members of a great dynasty. She was the sister of the Prince of Transylvania. When he came to the throne, he was the golden boy, strong, handsome, the hope of a much-suffered country. And she was the one and only little sister, an heiress to a great fortune and a glorious name. In only a few short years, her brother gets murdered, her family destroyed, and Anne Bathory finds herself accused of witchcraft. She is put on trial three times, found guilty twice, or her property is seized, and she's sent to exile. She's mentioned only in very few records. The only aspect of her life we have a little bit more information about is her love life. Her contemporaries seem to know exactly when, where and with whom she slept with. As a result, in Hungarian literature she is mostly described as a flirtatious, enchanting little thing who is sleeping around with everybody, even with her brother, trying to bewitch every man. We don't know when she got married for the second time. We don't know where she lived after she was banned from Transylvania. We don't know where, how and when she died. We don't know to how many children she gave birth to. Quite basic facts are missing. There is not even a portrait of her. And when I realized this, the lack of data, I realized that it was possible for me to come up with an endless amount of stories, to create an endless amount of narratives, and they all could have been true. Here I was with a few data, with a few cornerstones, and about to build a house around them, and it was entirely up to me how this house would be. Because this is how invisible even the sister of the Prince of Transylvania could be. Would we know more about her if she was a man? I think yes. And then the others, all the other women I came across while researching the records of the 17th century. They are not really mentioned in the history books, or if at all they are ascribed no importance. It doesn't matter that they were setting up the first printing press of the country or sending dozens of students abroad to study, to become doctors, scholars, scientists, that they were financing education and culture. 
And honestly, I think for a period, at, le at least a period, and at least in this part of the world, they were really running the show. You see, um, Hungary and Transylvania from the 15th century, or maybe even earlier, but let's say from the 15th century to the end of the 17th century, was the border of Christianity. It was a buffer zone between the Ottoman Empire and the Habsburg Empire. That means there was constant war. The men were away fighting from Belgrade to Poland, or even just protecting one of the important fortresses of the country. They were rarely at home. And then somebody had to do the work. Somebody had to harvest, had to make wine, had to run the workshop, do the trade, bring up the children and the money. In the historical legislative records of Hungary, there is data of widows of high rank who were the declared political and legislative leaders of counties. These women were preparing peace treaties, organizing armies, sending representatives to the parliament, taking economical decisions which had a huge impact on the future of villages and towns. But I don't really remember them being mentioned in the history books. Of course, some great ladies are mentioned uh, for sacrificing themselves for their husband, for sacrificing themselves for their children, for being very charitable. Some of them for fighting important battles. More of them for giving birth to an important man or marrying an important man, queens mostly, or insane women, or insane queens and saints, or insane saints, and of course, sometimes great queens like Queen Elizabeth I. So we know about the extremes and we know about women who were number ones for a period of time, but very little about the second and the third line, about the wife of noblemen, merchants, painters, scholars, preachers. And very little about their influence on their surrounding and their influence on our history. So I thought it is like missing data in a clinical research, like you get a picture book with half of it colored and the other half with black and white drawings. So as a fiction writer, I decided to color in these pages and not only with 50 shades of gray, because I think that these women deserve to be more real. And uh, so I'm creating their truth. The truth of my heroines, and maybe by talking about them and writing about them, maybe this missing part of history will be more alive, maybe then it will be a different story, a different history, a more complex narrative. And don't forget, narratives shape us. Thank you.